Thank you, Katie, so much. It is a pleasure to be here in San Antonio and to have the San Antonio Art Museum host the exhibition. I uh, hope you all enjoy uh, having it here. Uh, it was a great, it was great fun to install this past week and have the opening this past week. So hopefully uh, it will find its place here in the museum and the larger community. So I'm going to talk to you today about the exhibition and I'm going to start just by telling you a little bit about its origin. So as Katie said, in 2005 I started as the curator of prints at the Harvard Art Museums and one of my colleagues there, one of the preparators, the art installers, told me that his mother um, had a stash of prints by Corita Kent, who had been a nun in the 60s and taught at Immaculate Heart College in Los Angeles. And the family had these prints because his sister had gone to Immaculate Heart College. I had never heard of Corita Kent and often have, well, people often want to show you prints for the museum and you know they're not always consistently good and so I was skeptical about what kind of prints a nun in 1960s Los Angeles was making but I did the right thing and I said yes I would love to see the prints and I'm really glad that I did because he showed me this extraordinary group of pop prints that I had never seen before and frankly was shocked that I had never seen before because they were so good. And so I've spent a long time thinking about how Corita Kent fits into the 60s art practices and the pop art movement in particular, how her work is similar to that of her better known contemporaries like Andy Warhol and Ed Ruscha and Roy Lichtenstein and Robert Indiana and of course all these other uh, artists that you've heard of. Um, and I just want to read you this quote that I found that appeared in Look Magazine in 1966. And it said, Long before those young men in New York invented pop art, a small nun in Los Angeles was showing her students at Immaculate Heart College how to discover the novel and beautiful in popular magazines and packages from the supermarket. But Sister Mary Carita is a different kind of pop artist. Whereas the New York boys deal in a certain brittle archness, and then she says in parentheses, they are chic. Sister Corita and her students unabashedly affirm and celebrate the here and now glories of God's world. The words of Beatles songs, the pictures on cereal boxes, the sheen of stamps, the typography in movie magazines. And I show you here uh, a series of four prints that are meant to be hung together that she made in 1967 that depict the words from an E.E. E. Cummings poem, um, be of love a little more careful than of everything. And I think it's emblematic in many ways of the kind of 60s artwork that we all know. It's this uh, vibrant palette of melding colors. It incorporates language. And it has this very affirmative quality. So in today's lecture, what I plan to do is to introduce you to Carita's work, show you how it is similar to that of her contemporaries, and in particular, focus on the work that derives from food and slogans and other elements of the supermarket. So with that, just going to move forward. So let me tell you a little bit about Corita Kent. She was born in 1918 in uh, Fall City, Iowa, 
but moved with her family to Los Angeles when she was five years old. Her grandfather owned a motel and the family moved to Los Angeles so that the mother and father could have work. She came from a family with five children. Three of them eventually ended up in religious orders. She and her sister were nuns and she had a brother who was a priest. She went to high school in Los Angeles and then in 1936, upon graduating from high school, she surprised her family by entering the monastery, um, by entering the Immaculate Heart of Mary convent, which was in the Hollywood Hills in Los Angeles. Her older sister was already there, but her family had assumed that she would do something different from that because she had always been interested in art. But the Immaculate Heart of Mary convent had a college attached to it, and that college was where many of the parochial school teachers in Los Angeles and in Southern California, and in fact in the Southwest in general, were trained to teach in the Catholic schools. And so she studied art in college. She went to the University of Southern California and got a master's degree in art history and began teaching in the art department at Immaculate Heart College instead of going and off and being a parochial school teacher. She was there through 1968 and did all kinds of work. She is mostly known for the over 700 screen prints that she made, but she also designed books and posters and did corporate commissions. Um, she made a banner for the Vatican Pavilion at the 1964-1965 World's Fair. So that was the World's Fair where they brought over Michelangelo's Pietà to New York. And to get to see the Pietà, you had to walk down this long hallway. And in getting there, you saw this banner that depicted the words of the Beatitudes by Corita Kent. She won all kinds of awards in 1966. She was the Los Angeles Times Woman of the Year. She was profiled in Harper's Bazaar. And as you can see from the Newsweek cover that I'm showing you, in um, 1967, she was the exemplar of the modern nun. So she got a lot of attention in the 60s uh, while she was working. And so it's a, it was very surprising to me when I learned all this that in fact in 2005, 2006, when I was seeing the work, I had never heard of her or seen her work, which is what set me down the path uh, of the research that has led to the exhibition that is on view here. So let me begin by talking about the 60s work and what I think the conditions were that led to its emergence. 62 was a critical year in the life and art of Corita Kent. It was the year of the beginning of the um, deliberations of the Second Vatican Council, better known to everyone as Vatican II. And Vatican II was convened so that the group could deliberate and figure out ways to modernize Catholicism. There was the feeling that Catholicism had become somewhat arcane, it was losing congregants, and so there were moves towards updating the liturgy and the practices of the religion. And you know, a lot of very important changes were made as a result of Vatican II. The mass went from being said in Latin 
to being said in the local language. So in Los Angeles, it would, or you know, throughout the U.S., it would have been then said in English. Um, up until Vatican II, when the mass was said in Latin, it was said by the priest with his back turned to the congregation, which was somewhat, it created a real distance between him and the people who were attending mass. Um, music was introduced into the mass in the 60s. Uh, which be, has become a very important component going forward, as well as uh, more of a call and response so that the priest speaks, the congregation answers, the priest speaks, so that there is more of a sense of participation and belonging. And all these ways of making the mass more accessible, more intimate, are a result of Vatican II. Now, the nuns of the Immaculate Heart of Mary were, in fact, a very progressive order. When Vatican II was convened, they were wholly excited that there would be this uh, move towards greater progress. They wanted to be, they wanted to have more freedom in the communities in which they were teaching. They were interested in the modernization of their habits. I mean, you can imagine in Los Angeles as here in uh, San Antonio, those long wool habits are not exactly made for this climate. And so, there was the desire to make accommodations so that the nuns could be more comfortable and the people interacting with the nuns would be less intimidated by them. And so those were the desires of the nuns of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And so they were very excited when Vatican II uh, was initiated in 1962. The other important development in Carita's career was an exhibition by a little-known New York artist in Los Angeles who we all now know as Andy Warhol. And in 1962, Andy Warhol showed for the first time his uh, Campbell soup can paintings, which you can see on the screen. There were 32 of them. There are 32 of them uh, now, and they are in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And they were displayed in the gallery, as you can see, on a small shelf, as if they were being displayed in a supermarket. You know, they were not hung as art. They were uh, displayed in this novel way. And Carita Kent, who was teaching art at Immaculate Heart College at the time, on Fridays would bring her students to the local galleries and the local museums, and they saw this work. And she says that once she saw Andy Warhol's work, she saw the world through a completely different lens. Everything was different for, for her. And in fact, in the galleries right now, there are four videos showing. And one of them is called Mary's Day 1964. And one of the initial scenes is her describing her practice. And she talks about uh, going to see pop art in the early 60s in Los Angeles and how it influenced her work and how she taught. In 1962, Warhol made the soup can paintings, and then two years later in 1964, he made these boxes that are based on supermarket cartons, the kind of boxes that the groceries were delivered in. And, you know, they very much look like boxes, but in fact, they are plywood and they are screen printed by hand by uh, Warhol and the artists in his factory. And so between 1962 and 1964, Warhol made 
tomatoes, an important subject of art. And I think Rita Kent was very much aware of that and decided to enter the fray with her own depiction of a tomato. And this is a print that I hope you will all look at uh, carefully upstairs. She made it in 1964. It's a screen print, and it's called The Juiciest Tomato. And The Juiciest Tomato is the slogan, or was the slogan, of the Del Monte tomato sauce, of the Del Monte company for their tomato sauce. They used the juiciest tomatoes of all. And so Corita Kent co-opted that phrase. So here, she, um, amid the word tomato, she writes, Mary Mother is the juiciest tomato of all. And it was her way of crossing the wires of this new pop art style and its strategies with the ambitions and aspirations of Vatican II. So as she understood Vatican II, the idea was to make Catholicism more popular, more accessible. And so the, she decided to do it through her artwork by giving form to the Virgin Mary in this updated way. Now, you all know well uh, depictions of the Virgin and the Virgin and Child. And you know, there was a very traditional iconography for that subject matter. She instead decided to use this new format as a way to get other people, to get new people interested in Catholicism and to enliven depictions of uh, the Virgin. Well, as you can imagine, uh, the archdiocese in, Lo in Los Angeles was not pleased with uh, her attempt to modernize the Virgin. And as it turned out, one of the most progressive nuns of the 60s was actually living in one of the most conservative archdiocese dioceses of the country. And it set up this antagonism between the convent and the college and the cardinal that lasted throughout the decade. But Corita Kent, and so this was read as a challenge to church authority, but I really think that Corita Kent thought she was participating in the message that they were trying to propagate themselves. In 1963, Pope John XXIII had written an encyclical called Pacem in Terris, Peace on Earth. And he said that the only way that peace on earth was going to be possible was if the hungry of the world were fed. There were just too many impoverished people who couldn't lead normal productive lives because they were hungry. And Corita Kent really took that to heart. And so when across the street from the convent, a new supermarket opened in 1963, a market basket, she began going into the market basket and using what she saw there as subject matter for her artwork. Um, as Andy Warhol had used Campbell's products, she began to um, photograph all kinds of different products, and in particular, the Del Monte uh, uh, tomato sauce. But this print essentially set up her reputation that continued through the 60s. So I'm going to tell you a little more about what I think that she was doing. So as I said, she would take her students all over Los Angeles, and she would go to New York once a year to look at art. And so she saw all the newest art. So in 1965, she saw a retrospective of the work of Jasper Johns at the Pasadena Museum of Art. 
Jasper Johns at that time was making paintings and prints that incorporated a lot of words. And the words were often the names of colors. And he did an interesting thing with those names. He would often mix up the color that was depicted by the word. So you see in the upper right hand corner there the word red, which isn't in fact depicted in red. And if you look throughout uh, this painting called False Start um, from 1959, you see a lot of the names of colors, but not depicted in their true color. In the exhibition, there's a lithograph of his called Red, Yellow, Blue that you see in the lower right. And it too depicts those words, red, yellow, blue, but in black. And it very much speaks to the strategy that 60s artists were undertaking. They were using language in their artwork, but divesting it of its original meaning and giving it new meaning. Now, the meaning that Johns gave it is very different from what Corita Kent was doing. Johns was uh, showing how one could make new marks on a, on a canvas or on a print using words and numbers, as we know, and then forms like flags. But he's taking the meaning out of those words in the same way that Corita Kent would, over the course of the 60s, take meaning out of words. So here I show you uh, two prints joined together to create a diptych um, called Give the Gang Our Best, which was, in fact, the slogan of the, uh, the Canada Dry uh, Beverage Company. And you can see the advertisement from Life Magazine on your left. Uh, and it's a good way for me to tell you about how she made her work. So what she would do, essentially, is photograph the language she found in magazines, uh, develop those photographs as slides, and then project those slides onto big pieces of paper and trace the words. She could, in doing that, you know, um, manipulate the words. So she would cut the words out of a piece of paper, but she could rearrange them as she has done here. So instead of it being just a linear give the gang our best, we read it in this left right, left right fashion, and uh, where she's even turned over two of the words. And this tells us something about her work. She's very interested in how we read or, uh, works of art. She wants it to be somewhat of a difficult process. So it takes a little bit of concentration and looking, and you just can't pass right by. You actually have to stop and read the words. So having projected these words and cut, and cut them out of a sheet of paper, she would make a stencil out of that sheet of paper that she would attach to a screen, like a, uh, a screen for printing, which is very much like a window screen, and use it to print from. But she would use two registers of words on her prints. The first register would be one of these ads or a slogan that she could uh, take the meaning out of. And then the second register of language uh, would be in smaller text up here in like the blue and the yellow uh, shapes. And that would be an annotation on the larger text. And she went on to write a book in 1966 that she called Footnotes and Headlines. There's a copy of it in the exhibition. And she talks about how she would take these headlines and then annotate them with footnotes. Now, I think that there is something really interesting about this dual relationship of the large text and the smaller text that she used. And I think it's related to how one sees things 
in a church. You know, one enters a church and sees big pictures or paintings on the wall, and you see them from a distance, and you're expected to be able to read them visually that way. But you're also sitting there with a prayer book in your lap that you need to have in closer proximity. And she replicates that experience of looking far away and looking close at her prints. And I think it is in order to gain the viewer's attention, to slow them down and to make them actually look closely. Now, she wasn't the only one using language. And here I show you uh, a print by Ed Ruscha, uh next to a print by Corita Kent called A Man You Can Lean On. And you can see that where that advertising slogan came from. Uh, Klopman Mills made um, Vogue sewing patterns. And so the ads in Life magazine and Vogue throughout the 60s would say, a man you can lean on, Klopman. Corita Kent took that phrase, a man you could lean on, and eliminated the word, the name Klopman. And she leaves it to your imagination who that man might be. But you can see here that she has, again, manipulated the text so that a man you could lean on is has a curvy waved look to it as if those words have a kind of physicality a three-dimensional quality and it is a strategy that she shared with ed ruche who does it here in his print ooh o o o uh, in which he puts those three letters together now um, ed ruche uses lots of text in his work and you may know that he was um, raised Catholic. And art historians have said about him that his use of language may be related to that constant uh, instruction he received as a child about the word becoming flesh, the word becoming incarnate. It really gives the word a physical presence. And it's something that must have resonated with Corita Kent too, because she too gives this language a physical presence on the page. She does it here again um, in this print called Handle with Care. And the red text that you can see says, see the man you can save the most. Who can, uh, see the man who can save you the most. Now, when I was organizing this show at Harvard, I had a team of art history graduate students working with me. And one of the fun things that we did was try to find the source of a lot of these slogans that she used. Of course, they're no longer in use, so they weren't familiar to me. And you know, the graduate students are in their 20s, so they certainly weren't familiar to them. Um, and so we spent a lot of time trying to dig up these slogans in old magazines and newspapers. And see the man you, who can save you the most, we found, was a, a Chevrolet ad. So the man who could save you the most was your Chevy dealer. Which, of course, she leaves out the Chevy part in uh, this print, too. But she said an interesting thing the year before she made this print. She said, um, about a cartoon she had seen of Pope John the 23rd. And she said, when someone drew a picture of Pope John wearing an Avis, we try harder button, those words were no, those no, words no longer meant which car rental to patronize. And yet some of the overtones from its original meaning are there and make a contribution to the new situation. So it's exactly what she is doing uh, when she makes these prints. And as you know, she is not the only artist using language in this very evocative way. So when you think of pop art, you often think of this Robert Indiana love, this, it, this uh, the four letters have become so iconic. 
But what people don't always know is that Robert Indiana was raised a Christian scientist. And so in 1965, when the Museum of Modern Art in New York commissioned him to make a Christmas card, he thought back to his youth, he thought back to the churches of his youth, which because they were, because Christian science is a reformed church, it doesn't incorporate figural imagery, but incorporates mostly text. And he recalled the words, God is love on the wall, painted on the walls of his childhood church. And so for his Christmas card, he decided on the word love. Now, I think Robert Indiana's work is also shot through with a kind of spiritualism that doesn't get talked about because um, art historians of modern and contemporary art often don't talk about religion. And I think that I have uh, been able to do so so easily is because I'm trained as a Renaissance art historian. And basically, if you can't talk about religion, you can't describe any of the paintings. <laughs> so in looking at this work, I think it's shot through with all of these references to religion. So when Robert Indiana says, eat, die in a painting, you know, I think, oh, communion and resurrection. But the work doesn't get examined that way. And one of the things this exhibition has done is allow me and this team of graduate students and other art historians to look at the work of the 60s in a different way. Now, during the 60s, food was a very common um, subject matter. And unfortunately, because of the quality of the slide, you can, see, you can see the vegetables from this Jim Dine vegetable print. And I hope you go and see the series in the gallery. It's actually a really great looking print series. Um, but next to the vegetables, he's written uh, the names of vegetables. But he's done so in a very uh, underhanded and perhaps glib way. So next to the eggplant is written the word carrot. Next to the head of lettuce is written the word rutabaga. So he too is divesting uh, the pictures as well as the words of that original meaning. Which again, I show you here, Corita Kent has done. The big G stands for goodness, and this is still a logo that's used by General Mills. But in the 60s, it was a very common slogan. Everyone would have known it. The big G stands for goodness. But in the hands of Corita, as she said, there are both overtones from its original meaning, and the, there are these also these undertones. But it was also very inviting to a broader uh, pop art audience. So using the market basket grocery store across the road, she would go and see all these slogans, realize you know, how well they had been conceptualized by Madison Avenue and how meaningful food was in this moment of social progress. And it became a very um, uh, popular subject matter for her in the mid-60s. And in fact, she said, after you know, the, all of these strings come together, Warhol making the Campbell soup cans, other artists depicting food, them building the market basket, Pope John's encyclical about the importance of uh, feeding the hungry. Corita Kent says in 1965, groceries became a revelation. The people coming out, with, uh, coming out of the grocery store with bundles of food, it's all like a great ceremony, and the whole drudgery of shopping has become my inspiration. Which turned out to be a good thing, because she made 
uh, some very important prints using uh, that subject matter. So needless to say, bread was an important aspect of her work because of its association with the Eucharist and communion and the uh, body of Christ. But she doesn't use some highbrow iconography. She instead uses the logo, the colors, the slogans of something as common as Wonder Bread because bread and everything it represents should be available to everyone all the time, which is what Wonder Bread was. And so Wonder Bread frequently uh, was a subject of her artwork. And so in 1965, when she had an exhibition at her gallery in Greenwich Village in New York, one of the other nuns traveled to New York with her to go to the exhibition. And she later wrote back to the other nuns at Immaculate Heart, she said, the opening is crowded with Carita's fans. Andy Warhol is there. He would be captivated by the idea of an artist nun, especially one who uses Wonder Bread wrapping as a symbol for the Eucharist. And this is a print that you can see in the opening gallery of the show, uh, next to, right hung next to one of um, Warhol's soup cans and a print by Roy Lichtenstein. And you can see how well related it is to their work. And so just to give you a better sense of how pop art and Vatican II were related, I have projected on the screen here two definitions, one of Vatican II by a historian in which she calls the ideas of, what the ideas of Vatican II emphasized were reform, relevancy, experimentation, collaboration, youthfulness, intentionality, openness, humor, protest, and the vernacular. Now, those characteristics are very similar to the characteristics of pop art as defined by the artist Richard Hamilton in the late 50s when he said, pop art is popular, transient, expendable, low cost, mass produced, young, aimed at youth, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, and big business. And that in fact, is what Carita Kent made of it. So again, she uses another Del Monte jingle because Del Monte tomato sauce makes meatballs sing. And you can see the ad there. And she uses the words, makes meatballs sing. And across the lower register of letters of all sing, uh, or yeah, all sing, there are the words to a psalm. So again, she gets both of those aspects. So this is aimed at a youthful audience. It's ephemeral uh, in that it's a screen print. It is cheap. It's gimmicky, as Madison Avenue tends to be. But it also resonates with meaning. And when you approach the print closely, you also get this dose of a song. So I'm going to move on now to the late 60s in which her work uh, changed radically. After 1967, with the advance of the Vietnam War, with the civil rights movement in full swing, she began making more political work. And what you see here are two prints from that time. Uh, one called Yellow Submarine and one Stop the Bombing. And you can see both are related to the war in Vietnam. Now, Carita Kent was often questioned about her, her uh, political activism. And she used to say that she wasn't, in fact, an activist, that she was 
an artist and all of her opinions were embedded in her artwork that she was not going to march that she was not going to protest she was going to save that for those people who were up to that kind of practice but she made these incredibly meaningful prints and I like these two because they both refer to flags so you can see in the words stop the bombing that she's designed them so that they look like a flag waving in the wind, which of course makes reference to the American flag, the symbol of the nation and of a government involved in a war in which it's bombing Vietnam. The other print which in which she explicitly says make love not war and references Vietnam is the colors of the South Vietnamese flag and so she references both American patriotism and Vietnam in a nation in these prints. Now the Vietnam print also has the symbol or the design from the Beatles uh, Yellow Submarine album. She was a huge fan of the Beatles and if you go through the exhibition you can often see in the small print in the footnotes Beatles lyrics. And in 1966 she was interviewed by the New Yorker and she said about the Beatles quote a boy at our school, a music ma major, wrote a paper on the history of salvation according to Paul, Ringo, George, and John. He says the whole history of man is a kind of love affair between God and man, and the words of the Beatles songs are often very similar in content to scripture words. They have a freshness in that context. And so she uses them over and over and over again uh, in her prints, which you'll see in the exhibition. Her prints also make reference to the civil rights movement. She was devastated by the assassination first of John F. Kennedy, then of Martin Luther King, then of Robert Kennedy, and made prints that reference and commemorate each of them. Um, and here you see three of her prints that make reference to the civil rights movement. And I think it's important to show her, to continue to show her work now because it remains relevant politically. And to show how the work of the 60s in general remains relevant. So here I'm showing you an, uh, a print by Andy Warhol that's up in the exhibition called Birmingham Race Riot from 1964 in which the chief of police in Birmingham, Bull Connor, opened up fire hoses and let dogs loose on protesting uh, students and young adults in this act of aggression towards uh, the protesters. And I think that if Corita Kent were still alive today, that she would still be making work in this vein, that she would still think that these issues were important to visualize, to make known, to bring into conversation, and that that was very much what the power of artwork and uh, her prints uh, was. So I'm going to finish up here by showing you uh, what I think is one of the most powerful print series that she produced. It, like her other prints, combines these two registers of language, Power Up, which was the slogan of the Richmond Oil Company. So you would pull into a gas station, you would pump your gas, and you would power your car up. And in the, below the words Power Up, in those uh, panels are a 
Missive written by Daniel Berrigan. Daniel Berrigan was an activist priest in the 60s who, with his brother Phil Berrigan, was part of the Catonsville Nine who went to jail for burning draft cards in Catonville, Maryland at the, the recruitment office. And Daniel Berrigan and Corita Kent were friends and he in many ways ignited her political interests. And so he would send her texts that he thought were important to publicize. And so he sent her this text about bread and how important bread was both as a form of physical nourishment and of spiritual nourishment. And she added it in the bottom register in those colored panels below power up on this print. And in part it says, Berrigan writes, when I hear bread breaking, I see something else. It seems almost, almost as though God never meant for us to do anything else. So beautiful a sound, the crust breaks like mana and falls all over everything, and then we eat. And I think he means we eat in this very nuanced, uh, multi-layered way, because eating provide sustenance across these various spiritual and physical levels. And so Corita Kent then writes about the print. Power Up stops being only a sign about gasoline and starts talking about bread that gives man's heart strength. The word powers up and bread powers up. And you can see here that the print is hung over an altar. We were unable to locate the site of this altar, whether this was for a mass that was said at Immaculate Heart Convent or someplace else. I, I think she must have been involved in the construction of uh, this altar because on either side of the altar, um, you can see on these shelves are, in fact, issues of Life magazine. And they're open to particular openings. There's a cover of uh, showing Pope Paul VI, who preceded uh, John XXIII and finished out the goals of, uh, or the meetings of Vatican II after the death of John. And on the other side, is a Life magazine with a spread that shows, uh, and the head that shows um, race riots. And the headline reads, The Harlem Riots, New York's uh, Ghettos Erupt. So I think for Corita Kent, the religious, the spiritual, the social, and the political were all bound up together. And ultimately, she was disappointed that Vatican II, pop art, protest, social activism, didn't have the kind of power and effect that she imagined. And I think that, that it's that disappointment that led her in 1968 to leave her order to leave her teaching post at Immaculate Heart College and to leave Los Angeles. She moved that year to Boston, where she spent the rest of her life. She died uh, a resident of Boston in 1986. She continued to make art after this period, but it was never as artistically, socially, or politically engaged as this work that she made during this profound period in the 60s. And it's why it's what we focused on and what we show you in uh, the exhibition upstairs that I hope you enjoy. And I just want to show you one more slide because I love the fact that you put that power up print on a billboard outside of the museum. And I think 
It's funny because I think that Corita must have seen it for the first time on a billboard itself. So this is a billboard from the mid 60s in Los Angeles showing the slogan power up uh, that was put up by the Richmond um, Oil Company. And she took those words and made her own print from it. So thank you very much for taking this af Sunday afternoon to come and um, hear me talk about the exhibition and I hope you'll see the exhibition. Thank you.